All right, so same same question on uh, this one here, example nine. Does the EVT apply, yes or no? Well, notice that uh, you may not know what the graph of f of x looks like, but you do know that it's made up of sine and cosines, which are continuous for all real numbers. So this one should also be continuous for all real numbers. So it will be continuous on the given closed interval. So again, you just make the statement, EVT applies because, I've been using because instead of since, because it's actually more correct. I'm just trying to get used to it. Um, because f of x is continuous on the closed interval from 0 to 3 pi halves. Okay, so very direct to the point. Addresses the hypothesis of the theorem. So now we've got both of our endpoints, 0 and 3 pi halves. We need to find any critical values that are in the domain. Domain is all real numbers that are in that interval. So we take the derivative, and we get 2 cosine of x. And then that second term, the derivative of cosine is negative sine. So that changes it to positive. Uh, and then we generate a 2 from the chain rule. So it should be positive 2 sine of 2x. Now, remember, we always consider where the derivative is d and e. So I, I did kind of do the fork here. Uh, but it's never undefined because the derivative itself is also um, made up of sine and cosine being added. So it's never undefined. So I do want to know now where it's equal to 0. And so that would, that would earn a check right there. Okay, so I went ahead and set the expression equal to zero. Of course, you're welcome to consider that it's never undefined in your head and just set it equal to zero right there if you want. Okay, but I did it down here. Now, notice when it's equal to zero, we try to factor. That's our goal. If something's equal to zero and we're solving, we try to factor. The only common factor is a two, which I wouldn't even pull out yet. So if you remember back to your pre-cal days, um, we have angles that are not the same. We have a single angle X, and a double angle 2x. We need to use the double angle identity for sine. And so I have it written there in green. Uh, sine of 2x is 2 sine of 1x times cosine of 1x. So you need to have that memorized. Uh, and it's still equal to 0. So once we keep it equal to, or set it equal to 0, we need to keep it equal to 0 all the way down. That allows us to then get a common factor of 2 cosine of x, which I pulled out. So in the first term, this is another easy place to make a careless mistake. When you factor it out of itself, you're left with a 1, not a 0. Some people just leave a blank there, and they get rid of a term, essentially. And then in the second term, we're left with 2 sine of x. So if you quickly mentally redistribute, you can catch that careless mistake of calling that a 0 instead of a 1, because you have a placeholder there for it. All right, so now that it's factored, we'll set them both equal to 0. So either 2 cosine of x is 0, or I went ahead and solved the other one. 1 plus 2 sine equals 0. You solve for sine, you get negative a half. Okay, so now when cosine is 0, since we know the unit circle, we don't have to worry about finding values outside the interval. We're actually using the unit circle in the specified interval, which is from 0 to 3 pi halves, so quadrants 1, 2, or 3. So cosine is equal to 0, remember, up here at pi halves and down here at 3 pi halves. So I wrote those both down. Those are both in the interval, right? 3 pi halves, again, is also an endpoint, so he's kind of playing for both teams. So I'll use both of those values. And now over here, where is sine equal to negative a half? Well, that's going to be over here, not in quadrant 4 because it's not in the domain or the interval, so it's going to be over there, and of course, it's your 7 by 6. So really, we have two additional test values, because 3 pi halves was already in. So now to play the game, I'm going to come up here. Uh, I'll, again, I like to do it in an increasing order, so I'll do f of 0. And then the next one in sequence would be f of pi halves. And then f of 7 pi 6. And then finally, f of 3 pi halves. And this is no mean feat either, uh, plugging these in, right? Even as fun as it is with the unit circle, you do have to be very, very uh, diligent, okay? So when I plug in a zero, y'all can help me out. We're plugging it back into F, remember? Uh, I get sine of zero, which is zero, minus cosine of zero is one. So I get zero minus one. And feel free to write down some intermediate things here. Zero minus one is negative one, okay? Some, somewhere... Somebody's clapping for that. Well done, zero. Okay. F of pi halves. Plug in a pi halves. Sine of pi halves is 1, so times 2 is 2. There's the first term. 
And uh, now we've got to be careful for the others because when you plug in a pi halves, you're immediately doubling it, the angle, before you take the cosine. So pi halves times 2 is pi, so we end up with minus cosine of pi. What's cosine of pi? Negative 1. So we're subtracting a negative 1, which makes it a positive 1. So we get 3. And it's real easy when you got those repetitive negatives to carelessly make the mistake, right? Minus a negative one. Okay, you plug in 7 pi 6. Sine of 7 pi 6 is negative a half. And negative 1 half times 2 is negative 1. So that's the first term. When I plug it into the second, I get minus cosine of 7 pi 6 times 2. Well, 2 times 7 pi 6 is the same as 7 pi 3rd. I'm going to do that up here off to the side. 2 times 7 pi 6. That's the same. The 2's divide out. The 3, we get 7 pi thirds. Well, 7 pi thirds is not on the unit circle, but it is coterminal with one that's on the unit circle, right? 7 pi thirds goes all the way around to 2 pi, which remember it would be 6 pi thirds, and then it goes another 1 pi third. So it's coterminal with pi thirds. And let's see if we can use that coterminal symbol that I invented last year, or we came up with collectively, I should say. Because um, there is no coterminal symbol. Uh, it looks like a theta for angles, but it has an equal sign through it. I thought that was pretty apropos. Okay? So they're not equal angles. They're coterminal with each other, but they do have the same cosine value. And what is cosine of pi thirds? Also one half. Yeah. So we're going to have minus one half. And uh, that ends up being negative three halves or negative 1.5 terminating decimal. And now the last one, f of 3 pi halves. So sine of 3 pi halves is negative 1 times the 2 gives you a negative 2 for the first term, minus, you plug in your 3 pi halves times 2, and you get 3 pi. So I want to know off to the side again, what's cosine of 3 pi? Well, 3 pi is coterminal with 1 pi. So you could say cosine of 3 pi equals cosine of pi. That's fine. They have the exact same cosine value. Uh, but you can't say that 3 pi equals pi, can you? But you could put the little circle around it, and maybe that will start spreading. I don't know. Maybe this video goes viral just for this purpose alone. All right. I'm here with my favorite BC class this year. Um, not necessarily my favorite class. No disrespect to their classes, but of all my BC classes I have this year, this is my favorite one. It's Wednesday, November 7th, fourth period. Okay. And we're about half half man today because everyone else is uh, polka dancing and drinking uh, root beer, eating sausage. Okay. The coterminal symbol. Anyway, I forgot what I was doing. Oh, cosine of pi uh, is going to be uh, what? Negative one. So is it negative two minus one? No, it's negative two minus negative 1, which makes it plus 1, so we get back to negative 1. So, again, it's just trick stuff, bless you. Fun and easy, but very meticulous. Very meticulous. you got to be, uh, got to pay attention to the minutia. So we had simplified the, uh, the very top expression at the back at the beginning. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, what would you would have done? Uh, I wasn't from the cosine double and so I did Okay, let's talk about it then. Yeah, because that works, right? Simplify early and often. If you realize in the beginning that the angles aren't the same, you could try to make them the same before you take the derivative. Uh, the double angle identity for cosine is, and I'll put this in parentheses, it's the one that looks like Papa Pid. It's cosine squared of x, except it's minus sine squared of x, where Papa Pid is um, plus, right? All right, so if you were to do that, let's just kind of see what that would look like. I'll bring it over here. If I distribute, I get f equals uh, 2 sine of x, and then I'm going to have minus cosine plus sine, minus cosine squared of x plus sine squared of x. You can use pop a pit on it, right. They have to either both be negative, in which case it would be negative 1, or they're both positive. Um, now, you could take the derivative of this using the chain rule, but... Let's do one other thing, because I'm glad you brought it up. 
Because I have a sine squared and a sine, sine is kind of like the linear term, sine squared would be the quadratic term, I'm going to go ahead and get rid of this cosine squared by putting parentheses around it. And I can use a Pythagorean substitution on it so long as I, you know, replace it in the place where it's at. So cosine squared is 1 minus sine squared. Yeah. Now if I distribute and combine like terms, I get minus 1 plus sine squared plus sine squared. So if I write this thing in descending order, 1 side squared plus 1 side squared, that's 2 sine squared, and then plus 2 sine of x, and then minus 1. So there is another version of f. Um, would that be easier to take the derivative of? I don't know. There's a there's, uh, chain rule involved. So you could certainly do it. Absolutely certainly do it. Um, maybe this thing factors and you can use the product rule. So in this case, I don't know if it would be worth doing it on the front end, but you certainly can try, and you can finish that and compare methods later. But I'm glad you brought that up. Okay, so anyway, once we have it down here, I, instead of writing a full sentence, which normally we would do, actually, let's do that right now. So F has, and you could throw this in here, by the IVT. I'm sorry, EVT, EVT. And that just adds a little bit of weight and credence to your argument. So F has, comma, by the EVT, comma, a, uh, let's go ahead and say, I'm, I'm going to write it out, global, I just feel like qualifying it, a global max of what? It was three, right? Yeah, a global max of, and I'm going to put Y equals three, at X equals pi halves, and it also has a global min or absolute min or just a min of y equals what? Negative 3 halves. Good. At x equals 7 pi 6. So in this case, team uh, critical value swept the awards, right? Again, if you wanted to graph these kind of on your own, privacy of your own bedroom, whatever, uh, set your x min to zero, set your x max to three pi halves, and then you can actually verify uh, these results. But our goal is to be able to do it analytically, kind of like flying an airplane by instrumentation only, not by sight. That's what we're doing here, we're flying in the clouds. And we are very aware of the airstream, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, I saw a story one time about an airplane that was flying over the Andes Mountains, um, heading east to west, and they were, of course, way up above the mountains in the clouds, flying by instrumentation only. By their calculations, they had cleared the Andes Mountains, um, and so they started descending, and as they did, they were not over the Andes Mountains. They were right upon them, and uh, they crashed right into the uh, face of the mountain, and it got sucked up by uh, the glacier there, kind of covered everything. So for years and years, they thought it was just the, the case of the vanishing airplane. And it wasn't until like 70 years later where the uh, glacier had worked its way down the mountain and started spitting out the contents of the airplane that they, uh, they found it. It was kind of interesting. And uh, the reason that they crashed is they didn't know about the jet stream. They were flying into a headwind, which, of course, uh, we've talked about that already. When acceleration and velocity are opposite signs, speed is... Decreasing, yeah, so uh, they didn't have a line of sight. They thought they were over, but they hadn't. So kind of an interesting, tragic tale. Uh, I don't know why that came up. But I thought I'd share it with you. Okay, um, any comments or questions on that? EVT, play the game. It's the closed interval argument. If you have a function and it's continuous on the closed interval, this is how you find and justify absolute max and absolute min. Now, this is going to be... Uh, something that we're going to be using again later in the year when we look at word problems. There's a whole section coming up on what we call optimization. And it's basically finding absolute max or absolute mins in word problems. Okay, Like you're trying to build a fence and it needs to contain a certain uh, amount of area, but um, you only have you know, so much fencing on hand. 
what is the smallest or what's the what's the optimal size of the pen so that you get the area you want with a minimal um, perimeter or something like that. It comes down to finding absolute max and min. And so one of the methods that we'll be using back then or, or in the future is what we're doing right now, the closed interval argument. Okay. It's only more fun in optimization because we're reading words and we have to squeeze our own orange juice right? from the problem. We wring out the information from the word problem and we write our own equation. But isn't freshly squeezed orange juice the best? Especially when someone squeezes it for you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that code defeats my entire argument, what I was just saying. But there is that machine at the HEB, if you've seen it, right? Have you seen it? And it, they just drop them in there and it just squeezes it. So if you've ever had that orange juice, it's kind of like a tiny little, I don't know, like a quart. And it's like six bucks. Um, but you're like, man, this is good orange juice. Right? And then you start saving up for the next one. I don't know how that came up either. All right. Any other comments or questions? Any other beverages you want to talk about? Any eggnog drinkers in here? Yeah, no, no eggnog drinkers? Oh, I kind of like eggnog. I'll be the only one to raise my hand. Okay. Um, I haven't been drinking it lately, though. When we bought a half gallon, I drank about half of it. I'm the only one that drinks it. And it got pushed to the back of the fridge, and I forgot about it. And then it went bad, and then my wife's like, you didn't drink all your eggnog. And I'm like, you're right, I didn't. And she's like, that's okay, we'll just throw it away because it's no big deal, right? Yeah. Especially when you're in love. <laughs> okay. Anyway. I was saying, oh yeah, we got no, we don't have plenty of time. Let's just look at example ten A. What do we do if we want to find the extrema, absolute max, absolute min, and the EVT does not apply? As we already saw, you could still potentially have both a max and or a min, uh, but if you can't use the closed interval EVT argument, uh, what can you do? Well, the answer is we can use all the tools at our disposal, which includes sketching a graph. That's how we started the section. When we looked at the graph, it's real easy. So let's just start example 10A. We may not finish. Find the extreme of each of the following over their domain. Bless you by sketching the graph. All right, step one, find the domain of the function. We're trying to avoid division by zero. Are we at risk of doing that here? Do we have variables in the denominator? Yes, and we also want to avoid taking square roots of negatives. Do we have variables under a square root? Yes, okay. So if you remember from pre-cal, since the entire denominator is exclusively just a square root, you could take the radicand, 4 minus x squared, and say it just simply has to be strictly greater than zero. That makes sure it's positive under the radical. Now, we could take the square root of zero, but we don't want it to be zero here because that gives us a zero in the denominator. If there had been like a plus one or something on the outside of the radical, then we would have to consider the entire denominator not equaling zero and the radicand greater than or equal to zero separately. But in this case, this will cover both of them, all right? Now, that is a quadratic inequality. Can we solve it algebraically? Hi, go, sir. Do you like eggnog? Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty good. So we have to solve it graphically. Have you had it yet this season? I have not. You have not. Okay. Um, uh, no, I, I do not drink that type of eggnog. I drink the uh, store-bought eggnog, but I only drink about half of it. Okay. Yeah. Hey, man, good talk. Yeah, you too. Sure. So 4 minus x squared is a parabola with a vertex up here at 0, 4. Um, he tackled me once. Um, twice, actually. He tackled me twice. And it opens down. And we want to know what the x-intercepts are. It comes down to that. Now, at this level, you could probably just look at 4 minus x squared and figure out what the x-intercepts are. What are they? Negative 2 and 2. And again, if you can't figure that out, just set it equal to 0. You could do a difference of squares, 2 minus x, 2 plus x. Or you can extract the square roots. Just make sure when you take the square root that you don't forget to remember to do what? Plus or minus. Plus or minus. Yeah. Now we go back to the inequality. I want to know where that graph is greater than zero. Greater than zero is above the x-axis. So is it going to be outside of the x-intercepts or betwixt the two? Betwixt. Mmm, now I'm hungry for like chocolate and caramel cookie bars. Twix. Y'all prefer left or right bar? 
Right bar. Yeah. Yeah. My daughter was so confused the other day. She's like, what's the difference between them? And I'm like, if you have to ask, you'll never know. Okay. So the domain is the set of all X. Sometimes she doesn't like having me as a dad. Okay. There's the domain. Strictly between negative two and two. And that's about all we have time for today. So uh, we'll pick up here tomorrow. Um, should we quiz tomorrow? I don't think so either. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and remember, I'm still grading y'all's uh, quiz that turned into a test. Okay. I might have to take the weekend to do that because I'm going to Worst Fest tonight. And I don't know how well I'm going to be grading after Worst Fest. Okay. Yeah. Yeah.